Cole, and welcome back to Extra Milestone, your weekly film anniversary podcast where we take a trip back in time to discuss the classic films that have made the cinematic landscape what it is today. I am your host, Sam Noland. I host this show that you're listening to, which you could probably guess, and others on the Cinemaholics Network. And I'm joined by a very special guest, one of my good friends, returning to the show for what I am certain will not be the last time. It is Emily Kubankanik. Welcome back, Emily. Thanks for having me. It's when I realized that we were going to be talking about these uh, two movies that we're going to be talking about today, you were the first person that came to my mind. So I'm delighted <laughs> that, you're, that, uh, that you're here to do it. And it ended up working out remarkably well because, and the listeners don't know this, so this is a little peek behind the curtain we actually, a few weeks ago, the two of us missed our chance to talk about a Billy Wilder movie. The episode that ended up uh, having John Negroni and Julia Tatey reviewing The Apartment, that was originally going to be this huge ensemble with all four of us. And I think at the last minute, both of us just had scheduling conflicts and mm -hmm. it couldn't work out. So now's our chance. Dang it. I hope you're ex <laughs> as excited as I am. I am. We are... Going to be talking about Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard, which is celebrating 70 years this past August. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to do something a little bit different this week. Now, usually what we do is we start with the big movie, the one that will take up most of the conversation, the one that we presumably have the most to say about. Uh, and then we'll sort of, if, if we have a second or even a third movie, we'll do, we'll sort of wind down as the show goes on. But we're going to ramp up to Sunset Boulevard and we're going to start with a look at a very specific part of the silent era. Now, this will be our second silent film. And the first one we did was John Negroni and I talking about Buster Keaton's Seven Chances. <laughs> and now we're going to be talking about Charlie Chaplin, the other great silent comedian by most people's estimation with the gold rush now emily correct me if i'm wrong you had not seen the gold rush before this episode am i remembering that right yeah, that's true. I just watched it today. I had only Ooh. seen um, Modern Times and City Lights from uh, Charlie Chaplin, so Very I was nice. excited for this one. Yeah. And so, and what was let, let's uh, let's just cut right to the chase. What did you think of it? What was your reaction to the Gold Rush? I loved it. I haven't seen. I haven't watched his movies in a long time. I feel like I tend. To, I the two times I've watched his films have been like really sad parts of history i feel like it was like the 2016 election or something mm. oh, last time goodness. i watched something and they always he always does such a great job of making you feel good and um so this one definitely did that i <laughs> here we yeah. are again sort of mm -hmm. at that same point in history so that's actually very <laughs> fitting yeah but um i don't know like i had forgotten just how talented he is at being having a, a well-rounded movie that's not just comedy it's like so many things in to one and so this was like uh, a really good example of that for sure i'm delighted to hear that yeah this is my second time seeing the gold rush the first time actually was not uh far away from that time period you were just mentioning i think it was mm. very early 2017 where the world was sort of starting to slide downhill like pebbles were just falling away everywhere it was to quote uh gandalf from lord of the rings the falling of small stones that starts an avalanche <laughs> and i remember it was this time when i was taking in tons and tons of silent movies it was it was a good solid i want almost a year i think where i just watched as many of them as i could and of course naturally I ran across Charlie Chaplin sooner or later. I can't remember if this was the first one of his that I saw, but it was it was one of the first. And yeah, I remember really loving it. And so I was excited to get to go back and see it again. And I was really delighted. I had a few issues with sort of the narrative structure of it, which we'll talk about. But for the mm -hmm. most part, this is a really uh, just delightful 
comedy that holds up remarkably well, especially in the uh, effects department, wouldn't you say? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They the the plot of this movie is it's actually kind of weird to explain because it's a couple of different stories going on Mm -hmm. and like they take turns happening, which is really strange. Uh, But it, it starts out the first 30 or so minutes takes place in uh, Alaska, if memory serves during Mm -hmm. the gold rush, uh, which is where all of these prospectors were going up there in the hopes of striking gold, of making it rich in the uh, 1800s, I believe. And one of them, of course, is the little tramp, Charlie Chaplin's character that he played on numerous occasions up until and after this point. And he falls in with a fugitive of the law. What was it? It was it was black something. I forget the character's name. Do you remember? Um, no, I don't. Is it like Lawrence or something? I forget exactly what it is. I'm going to look that up right now. But okay. there's a fugitive. There's a fugitive from the law. And another, just another prospector. And they find, they wind up in this cabin and all these hijinks ensue. And what we (laughs) see is a good solid 30 minutes of just really good physical comedy. And what I was really delighted to find, or or, uh, to rediscover rather, was how kind of elegantly simple it is. Like, I don't want to fall into the trap of comparing Charlie Chaplin to Buster Keaton over and over again, but just for an example, it's it's not as uh, complex and clever, and I use that word in air quotes, the humor is not as clever as something that Buster Keaton might have done. It's not as really uh, like high budgeted or anything. It's just sort of finding something and then just making it funny, just presenting it in a funny way. And like one of the things that happens is that they're up there, they're snowed in, they have no food and they just eat a shoe. And that's kind of all there is to it. Like there's not really much of a joke there necessarily, but it is presented in such a way that just allows the viewer to kind of find the humor in these things that don't seem like they'd be humorous from the surface. Emily, I'm curious, what did you make of kind of the uh, comedic stylings of this first third of the movie in particular? Um, I, I liked it a lot. I mean, there's this point where, um, the three of them are in the cabin and one of them has a gun and like, they somehow always (laughs) find the tramp. Um, and just like watching that is so funny. Like, (laughs) I feel like, He's someone that makes me giggle when I watch. And like, I feel uh, like that doesn't happen in, for many, many comedies for me personally. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it made me wonder, all right, like, how the hell are they going to get out of this? Because it yeah. just feels like it's going on. But like, I didn't really mind it either. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's but, a movie that really just sort of strings you along. Um, mm-hmm. And in a way to where when they left the cabin... I'd almost forgotten that there was like another hour of movie. Like for whatever reason in my memory, it took place mostly in that cabin and they do go Mm -hmm. back to it later in the movie, but Mm -hmm. they really do mine it for all it's worth. I love the bit where, where Charlie Chaplin turns into a giant chicken. This is a joke (laughs) we see a lot of times actually where when someone's really hungry, they start looking at their friends and start hallucinating them as food. I wouldn't be surprised if this was the actual originator of that joke yeah i really want to know now because i just saw that in pen 15 they just had something just like that oh, really? yeah <laughs> that's hilarious i would <laughs> i would be very curious i think it, it seems like the kind of thing that this that it would have sprung out of this very specific joke right here uh mm-hmm. what are what are some other sort of bits of humor that you found yourself enjoying in uh this cabin segment in the cabin segment, um, trying to remember. I mean, I just like the way that they interact with each other. Uh, like, especially the, what is his name? Big, he's like big man something. I don't big know. Big Jim McKay. Big Jim, yeah, that's right. And, and, um, and I've got the name of the fugitive. It's Black Larson. I was close. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a good name. Um uh, <laughs> I don't know, like just the fact that like Charlie Chapson's like this super small short guy and then they have a big guy and I just feel like that just really goes well no matter really what the joke is or what the physical comedy is, it's just like works for me. Mm-hmm. Charlie Chaplin has this 
has this kind of manic energy at every <laughs> point. Like even when he's pretending to sleep, he can't even do that while staying still. And one of mm-hmm. my favorite, one of my favorite little physical ticks that he does is the way, and, you, and you'll notice this if you watch a bunch of Charlie Chaplin movies, the way he turns corners is hilarious. Cause it's like <laughs> he uses his foot as some sort of a break to sort of screech to a stop and then pivot and turn and start running in a different direction. And I actually do that sometimes just myself Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) at work. I would do that while like rushing around and doing a bunch of different stuff. And I almost, I almost, the floor was wet one time and I almost fell and really hurt myself. So I don't do it as much anymore. So there's a lot of danger involved in just that little, uh, that little thing that Mm. you may not, you may not realize on the surface, but it makes for a lot of really great comedy. The thing I love about sort of the comedic styling of this movie, if you will, and and come to think of it, kind of all of Charlie Chaplin's movies is that they take place in sort of a segment that seems to be a little bit away from the recognizable world. And the the way that that applies to the gold rush is that at the beginning, we get kind of a prologue about what the gold rush actually was. And we see footage of prospectors climbing these mountains and mm-hmm. trying to get to the the mines or whatever. And then there's Charlie Chaplin. Like it's just this kind of pivot to, and then there's this, this, this other side of the world occupied by these characters that you're about to watch. That's a little bit sillier, but maintains just as much of the drama. And I think that's one of Chaplin's real strengths. Mm-hmm. There's a melodrama to Chaplin's movies that is not present in a lot of the other silent comedians works. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think especially in city lights is where it works best. That movie is, mm. is almost not even a comedy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's very heavy and, or at least a uh, very emotionally honest in mm-hmm. a way that I think kind of sticks in the mind. It's not necessarily the jokes themselves, that you may remember, but it's the it's the feeling that you'll get from them. And so with that in mind, I want to move on to sort of the second and and third part of this movie in which we're introduced to Georgia. <laughs> Georgia Hale, who's introduced with an inner title every single time. That's just mm-hmm. in this cursive writing, Georgia. Little you can hear flower. the heart music. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I really love it. Uh, yeah, so the tramp is... Uh, is is finding shelter in the little mountain town. There's this really funny bit where he's going around shoveling uh, the f- like storefronts and stuff, and ends up <laughs> shoveling the snow to another storefront, and then Into ends the up jail in front of the jail and just leaves it there. So mm-hmm. I think I say that's a service well done. You know, <laughs> <laughs> me too. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, he finds himself in this sort of little, kind of this little shanty town kind of thing. And there's a tavern and and uh, he catches the eye of Georgia, who's this uh, woman living in the city. And what follows is the middle act where it's just the tramp kind of per- romantically pursuing Georgia. And there's a lot of humor and there's also a lot of, you, there's a lot of really palpable loneliness so i'm Mm -hmm. curious what was what what was how did you react to this part to this segment of the movie this is what i'm most curious about compared to the first because it's a little bit of a stark pivot from one act to the other yeah um well i was excited because if there's a love story in it i just love it but i also like the charlie chaplin that i think of like i think of a, a girl that he's trying to um woo in a silly way and so i was looking forward to that and so i really liked this part but i it made me realize that i don't know he's not i mean the tramp is not really cute in any sort of way (laughs) but you do fall in love with him and i was thinking like compared to i think his name's jack that like is uh trying to get Georgia too. And he's just like aggressive and manly and like, just really forward about it. And Mm -hmm. like everything that the tramp is, is completely opposite of that. Like, I think like the comedy kind of makes him a little harmless or like at least 
safe where you feel like safe. And so mm. like, I totally get why this beautiful dancer would be charmed by him. And so I was excited to see that play out for sure. Yeah, I totally agree. I think if I had to summarize sort of the, let's call it the romantic persona of the <laughs> tramp, I would use the word lovable. I think that's mm -hmm. probably what it is, uh, mm -hmm. is that there's this sort of, it's not even a naivete really. Like he's clearly feeling emotions and is understanding them and is, is having to cope with them. But also there is this, there's this way of looking at the world where nothing is ever too dramatic, you know, nothing ever becomes mm -hmm. too heavy to deal with or to just want to veer away from. And, and it's, it's very endearing. And I think that's something that it remains true throughout all of Charlie Chaplin's movies. I mentioned the circus. I think there's not as much of a romantic subplot in the kid, but that emotional hook is definitely there with mm -hmm. that one. Uh, and my personal favorite actually is The Circus, which came out in 1928. And that plays out a lot like The Gold Rush, where it's sort of it's sort of using its environment, sort of mining it, no pun intended, for humor. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, but it, it's a lot more consistent in sort of the how should I say this sort of the sort of the uh, storytelling goal of mm -hmm. it. Like there's kind of mm -hmm. just one thing going on and it follows that the whole way through and it's really effective i think so that's that's sort of my honorary recommendation to watch along with the gold rush is the circus which is my mm. personal favorite uh but yeah again the word is endearing and there's this sequence where and you'll see this you'll see stuff kind of like this in a lot of silent movies where he has sort of a fantasy kind of dream sequence of just having a nice meal with georgia and her friends and amusing them by by sticking a couple of forks into these dinner rolls and making them dance like feet and it's mm -hmm. it's the <laughs> cutest most adorable thing uh i w one thing i love about this uh scene and i've i don't even know why it's in there it seems like it should have been cut is that right before the uh, the meal is about to happen he has the table all set out and everything like i forget what animal it is but a like a mule or something <laughs> yeah just just walks in and it's <laughs> looking like it's gonna be this huge set of hijinks where the donkey mm -hmm. completely trashes everything but no just sort of chews on a napkin and leaves <laughs> so i'm wondering if that was sort of a bait and switch for the audience like ah uh, you think you're gonna get some zaniness here but no mm -hmm. it's, it's just uh, just tenderness so mm -hmm. i i thought i got I was really abused by that. It reminded me of an earlier moment where he like finds Georgia's um, photo on the ground and mm -hmm. the act of like this other guy watching him do it and take it and put it in his pocket. And like, you can tell that he likes her or like, but he doesn't feel like good enough and or whatever. And like having, us see someone else watch that and him be embarrassed or like whatever it just had that tenderness that um that other scene did too and i feel like is um what's so special about him yeah i think i think that's that definitely kind of encapsulates it in a nutshell and one thing i was noticing watching this movie is that this is 1925 this movie is 95 years old and yet there are so many sort of uh, how should I say, just sort of plot layouts that we've are, that we've gone into great detail describing. You know, the whole seeing a seeing a person as food while you're hungry and trying to trying to woo someone with your with your heart with your tenderness while this other person is just clearly uh, just has no emotion whatsoever. This is a lot of the same stuff we see in. Uh, in romances and comedies to this day and yet it doesn't it feels so genuine does it not it doesn't feel like it's copying anything or trying to cash in on any tried and true formula or anything it's just kind of doing it you know mm -hmm. yeah which is funny i mean like it is it was a formula at that point too um mm -hmm. but i think they found a way uh, or and I, I think like there was no other way 
at that point in in filmmaking. You know what I mean? Like they just knew that this worked and they do it so well, so they just keep doing it and it doesn't it like makes you forget that it's really happening and you're just enjoying it. Mhm. It really how should I say this? It just sort of nestles into your soul. You know? <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, that, that's kind of the way I describe it is that it doesn't sort of doesn't sort of barge in. It doesn't presume its own significance in any way. That's what it's, it's exactly the same thing that I've mentioned with the comedic stylings where it's not trying to be revolutionary or anything, although it is very well done, very well uh, accomplished cinematically. Mm-hmm. But there's an earnestness to it that is timeless as it turns out here we are 95 years later still still loving it Mm -hmm. and so with that i want to move on to the final act where we see sort of the two sides of the story we've seen thus far sort of intersect rather violently as a matter of fact because the tramp uh, proposes to Georgia. There's been a little bit of a drama with, you know, we're not, there's, there's been a little deception, but they finally realize like, oh yeah, we should be together. And then in comes big Jim McKay, <laughs> who has suffered amnesia as it turns out and needs the tramp to help find the stash of gold. And so they return to the, uh, the cabin from the first part of the movie and mm-hmm. what follows is one of the most remarkable showings of special effects in i'll say the entire silent era screw it i'll say it yeah. it's really it's really impressive i think mm-hmm. it's it's i think buster keaton would have been proud of it where the <laughs> cabin <laughs> is sliding down the mountain and they're completely oblivious to it they're both asleep and eventually it's teetering on the edge of a cliff and i really I, sh- I really should have done more research i have no idea how they uh how they accomplish this i assume it was on some sort of uh sound stage that were a- that they were able to sort of manipulate the gravity of somehow but mm-hmm. it's remarkably effective there was one time where they're standing on the cliff where you can kind of tell that it's a composite shot besides that totally seamless and it's really mm-hmm. intense isn't it yeah uh, yeah I was, I was, if if I had armrests while I was watching it, I would have been <laughs> gripping them. Uh, so yeah, what what did you what did you think about the way that this movie sort of tied up th- both the plots and the, the third act of it? I really liked it because for a while I was like, it was my first time seeing it, and I didn't really know anything about the plot going in at all. I was just like, all right, let's do it. Um, but I forgot. I was like man, what about the gold, though? Like, yeah. it's in the title. And, and then so I was glad that they, like, revisited it. Um, but I I don't know. Like, I love the tramp because he is always someone who looks unkept and, like, plays on mm-hmm. people's uh, assumptions about people. And mm-hmm. um, so then, like, to make all this money and and there is like a specific scene on that when they're like on this ship and he's a millionaire and but he doesn't <laughs> want to dress like that and yeah. um i don't know like that's just something that i love and i i'm thinking about people watching him in this last part um kind of infiltrate high society when <laughs> like people were going through so much at that time like i just can't imagine how fulfilling that would have been as like a working class person to see i don't know to see that play out in a in a comedic light or like lighthearted way and you know what i'll bet the tramp would make a good millionaire which there aren't <laughs> a lot of but i bet the tramp would be one and yes yeah, entertaining so it's, it's, one if if anything <laughs> at the very least i think you're absolutely right with that mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, so it's just it it all ties up in this nice little bow. Things end up working out rather well. There's no real melancholy to it whatsoever. Uh, Black Larson gets killed unceremoniously early in the movie. I think we forgot to mention that, but yeah, <laughs> it, it feels a little extraneous, but it's it's it is what it is. Um, and uh, and yeah, I think the only thing I would say about the Gold Rush that I might take a little bit of reservation with 
is what I mentioned earlier, just sort of the slapdash structure of it all, where they just took a couple of acts of a story that had almost nothing to do with one another and then sort of tied them up in the end. It's mm-hmm. a little it's a little jarring while you're watching it. I think there was maybe a way to weave those two first acts in together, but also it could have very easily gone wrong. So mm-hmm. they made a decision and they stuck with it as has been evident throughout the entire movie. And I'm glad they did because it's a hell of a time. And Emily, I'm curious, what if, if is uh, is there anything else that you wanted to mention about the Gold Rush? And if not, what are sort of your final thoughts on it? Final thoughts, I you know, for someone who loves film history, I'm really not very well versed in silent cinema, and mm-hmm. I. But every time I I watch it, and especially Charlie Chaplin, like. I think, wow, this was so enjoyable. I need to do this more often. And then I don't. And But I know so much about the lives of the people who were in the movies at this time. So it, um, I don't know, like, especially this one, it made me just remember the magic of, like, silent movies um, that I don't always visit very often. I don't think a lot of people do. Yeah, I think I think there's there's definitely no shame in that because you're also, I don't think you're alone at all. Uh, <laughs> I think John and I, we're talking about when we did seven chances sort of how a lot of cinema is silent like it's a good solid 30 years of movie history so almost a quarter of it mm-hmm. uh and yet every like every time i go back i'm always just as delighted and there's a lot of sort of pure visual storytelling it's kind of the most cinematic form of cinema you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. yeah and so i'm i'm glad to hear that you loved it and i'm curious uh to hear more about your journey of discovering silent cinema you know every time we do another one of these i'm gonna you're gonna be uh the first person i ask about it because i'm excited Uh, (laughs) and so yeah the the gold rush pretty damn good yeah it's hard to go wrong here uh i think this is as good of an introduction as any to not just the works of Charlie Chaplin, but silent cinema as a whole. I think it's got enough, enough of a com a combination of comedy and drama to really sell the capabilities of the art form. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big, big fan. So speaking of the silent era around, around 1927 is when synchronized sound started to emerge in the cinematic world and silent cinema started falling by the wayside matter of fact i'm sure you know this emily but charlie chaplin was kind of adamant about holding on to that like he Mm -hmm. was still making silent or almost silent in the case of modern times uh, Mm -hmm. movies well beyond sort of the extinction in air quotes of the art form Mm mm-hmm And that is as good of a segue as any into our second feature, which I'm very, very excited to talk about. It is Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard. I'm talking from the bedroom of Norma Desmond. Don't bother with a rewrite, man. Take this direct. Ready? As day breaks over the murder house. Yes, you'll read the big black headlines about Norma Desmond and this Hollywood scandal. But you'll never read the true story about the rest of us who were part of it. Me, for instance. Joe Gillis, a promising young writer from Dayton, Ohio. And Betty, that nice kid I met at a Hollywood party who knew nothing about me but knew what she wanted. Don't you love Artie? Of course I love him. I always will. I'm just not in love with him anymore. What happened? You did? Well, we should have lived happily ever after, like they do in the movies. But this was different, because this is a Hollywood story about the people who make the movies, the little ones that you never hear of, like Betty and me. 
the great ones like Cecil B. DeMille. All those who knew Norma Desmond, a strange woman who left her mark on all of us, who crossed her path. Has it ever occurred to you that I may have a life of my own, that there, there may be some girl that I'm crazy about? Who? Some car hop or a dress extra? What I'm trying to say is that I'm all wrong for you. You want a Valentino, somebody with polo ponies, a big shot. What you're trying to say is you don't want me to love you. Say it. Say it. Gloria Swanson, one of the great personalities of this generation in a role that comes to an actress once in a lifetime. Rising to the heights, William Holden creates a startling portrayal. And a new star is born in Sunset Boulevard, Miss Nancy Olson. Joe? Where are you? What's this all about? Why don't you come out and see for yourself? The address is 10,086 Sunset Boulevard. Yes, come out to see for yourself the film that reaches a new milestone of dramatic daring. The film that every critic says is a giant among motion pictures. And now, this was your first time seeing The Gold Rush, but I know this was not your first time seeing Sunset Boulevard. So what does that make this uh, viewing? Um, maybe third at this okay. point. Yeah. For a second, um, I thought you were going to say 30th. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh, my. I feel like if you watch that, if you watch this movie that many times, it might be a little sad. Uh, it yeah. It might be pretty sad. <laughs> Oh, no, yeah. but yeah, this is like my third time um, watching this one. I watched it for the first time in college um, when I was kind of really figuring out old movies. And man, this is a good one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the very best. I I watched it very, coincidentally. This is also my third time seeing it. I first mm. saw it. It, like immediately before I started college, like a matter of days even. Wow. And it I, it was one of those ones that I had just heard about again and again on lists of the best movies of the 50s, the best, you know, of all time and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And eventually, I, for one reason or, or another, I just decided to get around to it and I was completely floored. And then I watched it again in a class actually in mm -hmm. sort of a sort of an introduction to cinema class and i felt like a smart ass because i was the only one in the class who had already seen it beforehand <laughs> and now here i am watching it for the third time and man it just gets better every single time mm -hmm. so uh so emily i'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit if you were let's say that someone who's sort of becoming invested in classic cinema, let's say they approached you and said, Emily Kuban Kanik, yes, you <laughs> describe to me, g give me a little bit of a, how uh, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Sort of pitch Sunset Boulevard to me. Like if you had to sort of surmise it in a, in a sentence without, without giving too much away, I would say, what would you say? Um, I'd say it's about the psychological and emotional toll that Hollywood takes on people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's incredibly powerful. I think the, I, I, I forget if I came up with this myself or if I saw something kind of like it and then it just stuck in my brain, but it's a movie about how the limelight can be blinding mm -hmm. and how it can be and and even toxic at times it is mm -hmm. the story of uh joe is it is it gillis i forget the last name uh mm. it's i'm the worst with names you, you know this if you listen to to uh, uh extra milestone but it's william holden let's just say that it's william yeah. holden plays He's joe joe good old <laughs> average joe uh, is a struggling screenwriter in Hollywood, just can't catch a break to the point where s these two loan shark guys appear early on in the movie 
and are there to repossess his car. And he says, no, my, uh, my friend has it. But here's the thing. That was a lie. <laughs> and so Joe goes on the run. And did I mention that this movie opens with his corpse floating in a pool? <laughs> I think you forgot that. Um, I completely forgot. Yeah. It's, it's so it, it's, I actually realized while watching this movie, this is the third time in a row on Extra Milestone where one of the movies we're talking about starts with the revelation that someone has died and is told in a flashback. So we had mm. we had Agnes Varda's Vagabond and then we mm. had Rashomon last week and now Sunset Boulevard. What is it wow. with these August anniversaries that just, <laughs> death is in the air, I guess? Mm. But yeah, it, it starts with uh, sort of a sort of a narration saying like, "Yeah, so there's a here's a guy who's floating dead in a swimming pool with three bullets in him, and we don't we we don't find out until the very end for sure that it is being narrated by the slain man himself, and so it's kind of like." Um, it's kind of like American Beauty in that way, where that's the first mm -hmm. thing we find out is that I am dead, and here's how it happened. And I watched the movie uh, Double Indemnity this morning, actually, and mm -hmm. it has kind of a similar framing device told entirely in flashback. It was also Billy mm -hmm. Wilder, and I was like, I'm going to finally check that off the bucket list because it's, it's taken me way too long to get to that one. And that, man, that's another hell of a movie i can't wait to talk about that on extra milestone in 2024 it's Oof. gonna be a little while <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get there and so so just to just to finish sort of setting the stage a little bit mm -hmm. we see joe average joe william holden let's call him we see him flee from the police and pull into what he thinks is an abandoned house he's a just an empty garage uh and what looks like a house that hasn't been lived in in years and what he realizes very quickly is that someone lives there. It is none other than Norma Desmond, uh, sort of a sort of a forgotten star of the silent era, secluded in her home with her servant, uh, Max, played by silent film era director Eric von Stroheim, which mm. is just yet another <laughs> connection. And Norma Desmond is played by is is. Uh, played by Glor Gloria Swanson in one of the most captivating characters in cinema history. Is she not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. She kills it. <laughs> Literally. It's <laughs> yes. I see what you did there, Emily. <laughs> and yeah, we get the sense right off the bat that actually not unlike double indemnity, uh, coincidentally enough that this is a movie very much as we mentioned about the way that show business and not just any show business like in the big flashing lights and everything how that preys upon people within it and everyone in this movie has this attitude all, all the main characters at least with few exceptions of sort of crushing desperation that they're on the verge of their entire dream fleeing before them of their lives collapsing and it's it, it always amazes me just how sort of downtrodden sort of melancholy this entire movie is uh mm -hmm. even though it's even though it's the entire thing for whatever reason just in my mind i rem i always remember it being more cheerful and optimistic than it actually is but nope not sunset boulevard no. so emily i've i've talked a lot about sort of uh just kind of the general idea of this, uh, this movie but i would just i just want to get right into it so what do you think it is about sunset boulevard that makes it remain such a classic to this day um well i think it's a combination of the the subject matter of of hollywood um the performance by gloria swanson and i think like framing this in a film noir is really interesting and um like gloomy in a way that was popular at that time mm -hmm. um 
And I don't know, like, it always fascinates me how Hollywood sees Hollywood within its own movies. And so I think this is not, it's damning for them, but they chose to <laughs> to say it. And I, in yeah. such a way that's like devastating and thrilling and amusing. And I don't know, like, there have been a lot of movies about filmmaking but this one is just i don't it it's perfect in my eyes of like how to make it an interesting story it really is it, i i think i did a podcast a long time ago i don't even know if it still exists of <laughs> on part-time characters one of the first shows i did where myself and my friend maria talked about the best movies about movies. And this was my number one with a bullet and it still mm -hmm. would be, uh, I want to give a, I want to give a quick shout out to the cinematographer, John F. Seitz, who's mm -hmm. largely responsible for the incredibly distinctive look of this movie. Like even compared to other noirs, there's something about the impending, doom in every frame of this movie. That's mm -hmm. all, it, it's, it's almost, I was thinking about it while watching it where I don't think it's a horror movie, but if someone called it that it would be hard to argue with them. Like it's, it's certainly an unconventional horror movie for sure. I, yeah. I read that a critic did call it that, that they compared it to the universal horror movies in the way that it's yes. shot and I was everything. The exact same thing. Yeah. You're not alone. <laughs> It really, yeah, it really has this, uh, th just this gloom about it. And something I want to, I want to go back to what you mentioned a second ago with the way that it's sort of the cinema in air quotes is damning itself from the inside. This mm -hmm. is a Paramount movie and Paramount Pictures like is in the movie. Like, it's just so strange to see that that would never happen today. They would, they would make up like a fictional studio or something but no mm -hmm. there it is right there like there's the paramount gates that's something that always gets me and we see a lot uh or not a lot but a handful of uh well-known personalities within the entertainment uh entertainment industry up here in this movie not the least of which is director cecil b demille who appears mm -hmm. as himself in a supporting role so there's definitely like there's definitely a lot of credibility to the picture of Hollywood that they're painting here. And I think mm -hmm. that makes it all the more effective to know that th that this many filmmakers and storytellers, et cetera, were willing to get on board with it to say, yes, this is a story that needs to be told to the point where and this is and this might be a question that, that doesn't even deserve being answered i might i might just be pulling this off the top of my head but <laughs> i'm wondering if this at any point was intended as something of a cautionary tale did you ever did that uh, go through your mind at all emily um i feel like i mean i don't know if at this point in her career i guess maybe i when i think of a like a hollywood cautionary tale i think of a star is born mm -hmm. um it, especially like the first one because I don't know it it has the idealized version of Hollywood when you first come there and then she's like plucked out and whatever but this one just doesn't contain any of that hope at all mm -hmm. and so yeah. I um yeah but I could I could see that I'd have to yeah I have to think about that yeah, it's actually hilarious that you mention A Star is Born because that was actually going to be uh, my recommendation at the very end. Not the original, though. The oh. uh, the 1954 version with Judy Garland, which is actually my favorite version of A Star is Born. Uh, mm. So, But I, I think all of them are good. The 76 one, I don't especially seen... care for. Yeah. Oh, yeah? I've never yeah, seen the, it, yeah. The 76 one is... Uh, it's it's a noticeable departure from the first two, which are tell a very similar story, and so there were some pitfalls along the way. But you can see how it sort of paved the way for the most recent version. So I at mm -hmm. least owe it a debt for that. Uh, and also, it's just it's Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson. I mean, how do you go wrong? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, so so let's uh, let's get into a little bit more 
uh, detail of the plot. So we're sort of jumping around a little bit, but such yeah. is the nature of our collective mind. So <laughs> one thing, and it's not something that I always forget when going back and watching this movie every time, but it's something that I always just, it, it feels like I'm rediscovering it for the first time, where the first thing we see happen as Joe enters Norma Desmond's house and is escorted upstairs by Max because they think that Joe is arriving with a coffin, a coffin for her <laughs> pet chimp who has just died a horrible death. They never go back to that. I was reading up on the on how sort of this came about and Billy Wilder was talking to a uh, art director or a designer or someone of that nature and they were mm. asking so how do you want this how, how like how do you want this part to come across and billy wilder said and i'm paraphrasing of course but said something to the effect of oh you know just like your average ordinary everyday chimp funeral you know <laughs> i would love to be there i would love to be a fly on the wall during that scene when they were filming that and it sets the tone right off the bat that this place this is unlike any other place you've ever seen it's almost like this mythological domain norma mm -hmm. desmond's house mm -hmm. that it, it feels like it, it it feels completely different the set design of the house again it almost doesn't even feel like a house it is but it's so big and cavernous Mm -hmm. And just kind of strange with like the way that there are no locks on the doors or everything. And the furniture just seems a little bit strange. And it, it's, it's as if he's slowly falling into this, uh, like the, like the den of some, uh, of some, how should I say of some mythic creature? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. A lot. I mean, it's, it perfectly captures everything that I've read about Hollywood stars that mm. they're always into some weird shit. <laughs> Either it's a monkey or whatever, but there's always uh -huh. something weird that they're fixated on. And then the decoration has to be completely over the top and completely un like impractical. And um, it doesn't actually feel like a home. And so, like, everything in this just feels so right to me, and I love it. Oh, my. You know what that reminds me of? And this wasn't going to be right, my recommendation of it, but I was just reminded. Have you ever seen the Jean Cocteau version of Beauty and the Beast? I haven't. That is the castle in that movie is designed unlike anything you've ever seen. It reminded mm. me a, it reminds me a lot of this house we see. Uh, granted, in that movie, the the light fixtures are held by actual human hands emerging from the wall. So oh there's goodness. nothing. It's really stunning. I'll never pass up an opportunity to recommend that movie. Uh, there's there's nothing quite so surreal in Sunset Boulevard, at least not as straightforwardly surreal. But it is definitely creating a similar environment of mm. this sort of. Oh, what's the word? A uh, uh, fatalistic environment, almost, mm. and coupling that with the end of the movie, as we find out, we're we're assuming you've seen it, so we're giving away the ending where uh, where Joe is shot and killed by Norma. It definitely like going back and watching that from the beginning, knowing that ending, you definitely get the sense that they're kind of trying to get across that in Hollywood, it's kill or be killed and if you're lucky enough to make it long enough without having to do one of those then that had better be good enough and that's where i think uh max the butler fits in where you can mm. tell that he's just cut his losses like he's a filmmaker who's faded completely into obscurity and saying like listen this it's not a great life being the servant for this uh for this faded actress but it's what I got, and I'm lucky to make it out with this. Did you ever get mm -hmm. that kind of sense that they're trying to that they're trying to almost warn people away from Hollywood in some weird way? I think uh, maybe a little bit, and and I think I don't know. Everyone 
that they write about or that has made history in some way has said that there's no other way of life that they could ever imagine. And Mm -hmm. I don't think any of these people are willing to accept that maybe it's not what they wanted, but they're, they're not going to ever change it. And even if they uh, kill someone or um, become a servant (laughs) in order to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. There is, you don't see a lot of stories about someone achieving moderate success in show business. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like it's it's always either the tremendous soaring success or the crippling fall from grace. And a lot of the times it's both. And so mm-hmm. there are there are countless movies that are kind of like this, but they never get quite the same uh uh imposing haunting effect Mm -hmm. as sunset boulevard i think yeah me either i i mean like the only other one i can think of is in a lonely place is similarly upsetting and Mm. um dark but in a different way for sure you want to know the funniest thing ever is that that movie was almost we almost went with that. That's also eligible yeah. for this month. And I was thinking about including it as a third movie. And in retrospect, I wish I would have because <laughs> would have been interesting. It would have fit in really nice with this. Yeah, in a, in a lonely place. That's uh, Nicholas Ray, right? Mm-hmm. And Humphrey Bogart. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's it's been a while since I've seen it. Is he's a is he screenwriter. A, a, a screenwriter? That's right. Mm-hmm. I knew he was a writer. I forget if it was uh, for novels or movies. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's also a really depressing movie about sort of just just how it weighs on a person, you know, mm-hmm. whether they're successful or not, and especially if they're successful. And that's what we end up seeing with Norma Desmond. So there are a few other characters in this movie. Uh, who I wanted to touch on a little bit. The first one is, and oh my goodness, my memory. It's Nancy <laughs> Olson who plays Betty? Mrs. Betty uh, Schaefer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, it's like we're playing the ten thousand dollar pyramid or something. <laughs> and and when you're when you were mentioning earlier how we don't see with Norma Desmond, we don't see sort of the rise to grace we only see the fall from it if, mm-hmm. if there's that if if there's any place for that in this movie it's probably this character right here who yeah. we meet early on who's uh sort of got this starry look in her eyes like she's doing a lot of uh sort of work on scripts and stuff and i think is working as a uh, secretary at parabout at first um, mm-hmm. oh by the way you want to know something i noticed is and i have no idea if, if this is intentional the executive who Joe pitches the first script to at the beginning of the movie has mm-hmm. the same name as Fred McMurray's character from The Apartment, Sheldrake. I wonder hmm. what the intent was there, Billy. <laughs> if only I could ask him. I'm sure it was a coincidence, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe they're distant relatives. <laughs> Easter something. eggs in the wilder. There aren't a lot of them, but when you come across them, you got to seize them and appreciate them. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and she is sort of, she sort of has this ongoing professional slash uh, somewhat unprofessional race, uh, relationship with Joe, who is eventually takes to sort of sneaking off at night to go secretly write scripts with her. Ooh, how naughty for the 50s. <laughs> And yeah, I think she's definitely sort of the stand in for the reason that all these people probably go to Hollywood is to pursue that dream. And Mm -hmm. I get the sense that it 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 remains. How should I say this? The the dream of Hollywood for everyone who's still there, it remains feasible just long enough that it doesn't make sense for them to leave. And that's why we Mm -hmm. have so many characters in this movie who are clearly just kind of there because they feel like they have no choice. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I'm actually curious, Emily, have you ever been to Los Angeles? I haven't. Oh. I know. I One day 
I'll hit all the spots of that I've read about for sure. They better still be standing by the time I get there. Oh goodness, yeah, they better still be in. They better still be in our operation. Hopefully, mm-hmm. I I've been there one time. I went there last year, uh, shortly after. Actually, I went to San Francisco. That was last summer, and I decided, you know what, I'm in California. Let's go to L.A. Got mm. nothing better to do, and. I was only there for a day or two, but I definitely got this sense uh, that this movie paints. So I can tell that it's held up remarkably well. Like you, you watch this movie and a lot of other LA movies of which is certainly a genre unto itself. Mm-hmm. And you just get the sense that it's almost like what, what's that? Uh, this is, this is a weird comparison, but what's that planet <laughs> from Thor, uh, Ragnarok, where where Jeff Goldblum lives, and everything just sort of ends up there. You're asking the wrong girl. I have I, seen that movie, but I don't know any of the names or specifics. I don't. But remember I, I the, remember what you mean. I don't remember the name of the planet, but they. I think someone at one point says, "Like, yeah, everything ends up here one uh, sooner or later." So it's kind of like the Los Angeles of the cosmos, and that's the sense I get <laughs> from all of these movies. Is that is that it everything not how sh- uh, I'm, I'm doing a terrible job articulating this not literally <laughs> everything and everyone ends up there at one point or another but every kind of thing and every kind of person ends up there and as mm. such from one even one neighborhood to the next it will be just a just a stark difference and i definitely got that sense in just the short time that i got driving around that city and seeing all the different sights that there were to see. And I, I just kept thinking about Sunset Boulevard repeatedly. And it was not until this viewing that sort of the poetry of the title of the movie really uh, became clear to me how it's mm. just, you know, it's, it's a sunset. It's supposed to be this romantic thing, this closing of a chapter in preparation for the start of a new chapter, but also, it is very definitively the end of something and how this town talking about LA, this town will chew everyone up and spit them out, you know? Mm -hmm. And somehow everyone like assumes that that's not going to happen to them Uh (laughs) and they keep doing it, which is just (laughs) so entertaining because event, some people do make it, I guess. Yeah. That's, that must be it is that, the possibility of success is that much greater than the probability of failure, you know? Mm -hmm. Outweighs it for them, for sure. And so with that in mind, I'd like to ask, uh, there, there are a ton of other things in Sunset Boulevard that we could touch on. So I'm curious, Emily, what are some other aspects of this movie that we haven't gotten to yet that uh, you wanted to mention? Um, I, I feel like the fact that this is a, a woman star is yes. um, something that we haven't really talked about. Um, especially, I mean, like, and we haven't really even talked about the fact that it's talking about silent cinema and uh, like the fall of the, or that <laughs> That's either. That's true. Yeah. But, <laughs> We're so scatterbrained. We're barely getting into it. So much to say. Um, uh-huh. But yeah, I mean, I think knowing that this place especially seeing betty she's young and fresh and whatever and so like she has the potential but you see norman you know that that goes away at some mm-hmm. point and it, especially for women more i mean um i think they said i was reading something that like gloria swanson actually looked the same age as william holden uh-huh. at the time that she was but knowing that she was as old as she was like that's why she got this role and whatever but like there's a the pressure and i think all female stars ended up feeling this way i think of joan crawford of of just like mm. how she didn't let that happen and um maybe had a similar breakdown um that norma does not quite but uh, mm. A little bit, um, but just that refusing to let people say that you're past your prime when uh, the male stars were able to go far 
longer in their careers um, age wise. So yeah. I was glad that that was part of the story because I think that's really interesting. Yeah, you know what? I'm looking up right now because I because they say in the movie that Norma Desmond is 50 years old when the events take place, which is not old at all. Like that's no. middle aged, and yet mm-hmm. she's clearly been so far out of uh, out of the limelight. So so she was she was. F- actually 50 at the time so her her character's age is the same age as herself and yeah that's mm. it's, it's exactly what you said men will act from age eight potentially to the grave like there's yeah. not really a limit whereas and this is it's it's i think it's it's fair to assume that it's gotten a little better with time but it's still a huge issue where there's kind of this cutoff point for mm-hmm. women you know where mm-hmm. They can play, let, let's just say the ingenue, so to speak, just to sort of summarize it in a word. There's mm-hmm. that period, and then they can play like a mother, maybe, and mm-hmm. then this, and then this sort of age range where they're a little bit more of a mysterious presence. And then that's kind of it. You don't see a lot of old women in movies. You know what I'm saying? That are given the consideration that this one is, or that like, younger roles are you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so yeah which is which is a which is a damn shame and it really there's Mm -hmm. no reason for it to ever have been that way and i really i i am so glad you mentioned that because i might have i may have forgotten about that completely with how scatterbrained i am Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh yeah you do just get this sense that she was kind of how should I say this? That she was kind of told that she was past her prime. You know what I'm saying? Like it was mm-hmm. clearly not her decision. Mm-mm. People just stopped caring about her. One of the first things she says, and I hope I get the quote correctly, is uh, I am big. It's the pictures that got small, mm-hmm. which is really summarizes her character really wonderfully. And mm-hmm. you can tell that she's just stalwartly refusing to be cast off in that way Mm -hmm. and yet the the power of hollywood just seems to be too much you know like no one like she keeps trying to (laughs) trying to sort of infiltrate movie sets even and and try to uh you know pitch her scripts and stuff to filmmakers and stuff and they're just you can tell that they're kind of looking at her like okay all right let's just see if we can brush her off to the side one one very telling sort of little plot point i like is that we find out that paramount studios has been calling her house repeatedly and we're not sure why it turns out they liked her car and they wanted to rent it because it looked like it, because they thought it would look good in a movie. So she is just so not worth the time to anyone else. And so you can mm-hmm. tell why she would become so jaded by this system. And I think that's part of what makes it such an effective noir is that you could like you totally buy her plight and you're and you're affected by it, but also you're like, okay, she did murder a guy. That's also <laughs> true. <laughs> I, yeah. I would, I would, I'm very curious to hear, do, how do you think that sort of, uh, uh, how should I say this, sort of layer of her character affects the rest of the movie as a whole? That she murdered someone? That That she murdered someone and by the end of the movie has clearly kind of retreated into her own mind. Like, I think the universal monster thing is a great comparison because mm-hmm. she's clearly uh, be, been made this way by others. Like, it's not her fault that she's mm. viewed as this, you know? Yeah, I totally see that. I'm Well, I mean, watching her kind of be laughed at from at the Paramount Studios um, and just other instances... I just feel like, I don't know, they do such a great way of saying there's no real other choice for her. Mm-hmm. And so you you do accept 
and you say, well, I don't blame her. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like in that moment. Yeah. And like you feel bad, but at the same time, I don't know. It's it's a really sort of morally confounding movie. And that's what I love so much about it, is that it doesn't have it doesn't it doesn't give any easy answers. Even the ending mm-hmm. where she says, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up, and walks into the camera clearly the I, I i the implication it seems to me is that she's kind of fallen completely into her own fantasy you know mm-hmm. uh even to the point of all the other all the investigators and the paparazzi and everything just sort of letting her do it like let's at least give her this uh mm-hmm. let's well- let her th- And I think, like, this is what people expect out of, like, fallen stars. They expect them to have some crazy end. And so people are, like, Hollywood's ready to capitalize on that, like, Mm -hmm. as it's happening to her. And so, I mean, like, it is then even sadder that, like, they don't really care about her mental state. They're just, like, shocked by her story. Mm -hmm. It's almost like I I hear this kind of sentiment a lot, how when it comes to just things kind of like this happening, where someone becomes kind of disenfranchised by just a system that's been set in place and that they feel like they have no control over it. Mm -hmm. No one seems to care until they uh, lash out for lack of a better phrase. No one seems Mm -hmm. to notice until they do something that directly impacts them. So I think it makes it actually a very empathetic movie through that lens, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's really interesting. I never considered that. I mean, like, no one that doesn't care about you won't um, recognize that you're struggling until Mm -hmm. you affect them personally. So yeah, that makes sense. (laughs) That's something that I feel like we can all relate to. And that's part of, I think that's part of what makes this movie so effective is even though, and I think we're, we're not in the two of us. I, we're we're not in the movie business, you know what I'm saying? We're but no. <laughs> I think we're we're in the we're in the journalism Adjacent, business. Yeah. yeah, I think that's fair to say. So maybe we're a little bit more keyed into what this movie is tapping into. But I think that is something everyone can relate to in one way or another, where it is just difficult to try and not only find success, but to keep it moving consistently, Mm -hmm. potentially forever. Like, it seems like it's almost a miracle that anyone can do it at all. Mm -hmm. And then when we see it play out in sort of this actually really quite exciting way, like I forget if I've said that explicitly, but this movie is just a blast to watch as downtrodden as it is. uh, It's, really intense and really exciting. So Mm -hmm. that is another part of what makes it so universally appealing. And it's, it's just one of the greatest of all time. I think that's, I think that's something that uh, we can agree on. And yeah. One last thing I wanted to touch on, which you brought up a moment ago is the connection to silent cinema. The very reason (laughs) that we paired these two movies together, which I think is just kind of an extension of what we've talked about so far where th- this is 1950 so this is a minimum of 20 years after silent cinema had effectively died out and you get the sense even here just a mere 20 years later that it has become this bygone relic of the art form that no one seems to pay any mind to if they weren't literally alive Mm -hmm. to be there for it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that is something we still see to this day. One, one small little detail that I actually uh, was kind of fascinated by is how when Joe first finds out that he's in Norma's house and he doesn't know who she is, even though she was presumably a 
pretty big star for the era. And Mm -hmm. we don't, I I forget exactly how old if we find out Joe is, but I think it's fair to say he would have been at least alive for the silent era. So you definitely get the sense that he's just not really paying it any mind. And yeah, it's yeah. Outdated. It's kind of tapping into this thing that we still see uh, those of us who really care about all facets of the art form. We see that a lot of it just kind of gets ignored and sloughed off to the side because it's in air quotes, not relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is yet another advocation for, uh, for going back for that. That's what this entire show is about going back in time (laughs) to discover the classic films that made the cinematic landscape what it is today. These are the things that are responsible for what we have now. And Mm -hmm. there a lot of time, a lot of the time it's just as good. And a lot of the time it's better and it's really worth seeking it out. And so I'm glad that we get to do it. So was was there anything else? What, What else do you think the connection to silent cinema uh, uh, bears on this movie or, or did I kind of say it all? Um, you definitely mentioned it. I don't think we mentioned the fact that Gloria Swanson was a huge star, a huge silent star herself. So mm. it's really meta that they casted her in this. <laughs> and especially because like Cecil D De- uh, or B DeMille is in it and he worked with her. And so like, it feels almost like it is a real story and it's based off of her actual life, but it's not. And um, I don't know. I am fascinated by the transition between silent cinema and sound. Um, There's so many stars that didn't survive simply because of their voice, um, because of, I don't, yeah, like they're, they were used to using their face and their body more than their words. And like to see that die off and to change that so quickly, like it's completely understandable <laughs> why these people were so jarred and, and shocked by it. It was just, it, it kind of happened on a dime really. Like there were some, there were some, moments of sort of dipping their toe in the water like the jazz singer is the first movie that's credited as having synchronized sound and that and it's actually Mm -hmm. only for a couple of scenes so it's it wasn't like a day and night thing where one week everything was silent and then the week after that everything was sound so there was a little bit of Mm -hmm. a transition period but it was so fast it took place in in functionally like two or three years Mm -hmm. that's that's all it took and a lot of a lot of filmmakers, a lot of actors, a lot of directors and so on just couldn't keep up with it. I think Buster Keaton is one of the most famous examples who's in this movie. And we see Mm -hmm. Buster Keaton uh, just playing bridge with Norma Desmond. And he looks so sad. I feel so bad for him, especially knowing uh, how much he suffered with the transition to sound and the, 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 the whole movie singing in the rain. That's what it's all about is Mm -hmm. that transition. And so it is just it, it it all builds to this product of this movie where it's it's kind of the sacrifices of trying to make art that changes the world. You know, like one thing mm-hmm. I, I find fascinating about this movie is that there's a not and it's it's in there, but it's not very much of it. There's not a ton of thought given to cinema as an art form as a way of expressing something you definitely Mm. get the sense that the business side of it has overtaken everything yeah and if there's one person who's who's just in it for the artistic side of it it is norma desmond you know you you do get the sense that joe is kind of not really that entranced by it you know what i'm saying like he he just kind of views it as a job just a way to make get in big exactly Mm -hmm. yeah and so it's it's, so with that in mind i'm curious i'm I'm fascinated by this let's talk about some recommendations of similar movies if 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 you did not have anything else to say about sunset boulevard and if you do by all means now is the time but what's 
a similar movie or two that you would recommend that the listeners also watch to go along with it? Um, so the first one I have is called The Bad and the Beautiful. Oh, um, ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, and it's similar in that um, it's a Hollywood on Hollywood. Uh, Lana Turner. Um, oh, my God. Kirk Douglas. <laughs> um, couldn't remember his name. Um, and they are both like he is the director um and she is a rising star um and they're in a relationship and it's just it's very melodramatic but in the most entertaining way and i think it's it's sad at the same like it's sad like this one but um it's just a different struggle um Mm -hmm. in hollywood and then my other recommendation is a silent movie um my favorite star that went from silent cinema into sound very briefly was Greta Garbo. I think Ooh. she's like the most fascinating person in the world, but she was in a movie, uh, two movies of the same, well, two versions of the same movie, um, Flesh and the Devil with uh, John Gilbert. And mm-hmm. there's a silent version. And then they remade it as a sound uh, film and she demanded that he be in it with her, but oh. that basically ruined his career because he had a feminine voice and people said that didn't fit his image at all and didn't support his chemistry with her. Who ha- She has a very deep Swedish voice. And um, so she was able to go on after that one for a little bit longer, but um, he had kind of had his career fade away like Norma. So um, yeah, if you're interested in like seeing other stars that actually went through that and it's a really good movie. Nice. I actually, I I've seen the silent version. I had no clue there was a sound version. So this is mm-hmm. actually news to me. Uh, yeah. Greta Garbo is awesome by all means. Uh, uh, watch anything that she was ever in. You know, she was actually considered for uh, the role of Norma Desmond. So I'm curious to see how uh-huh. that turned out. That's yeah, I doubt been... she I think at that point she was in her cave. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Probably not willing to be in a story like this at the time. So, uh I think I think I think they ended up better off for it. Uh that's always one of my favorite things to read about when doing these is like the alternate casting choices. We didn't I didn't mention this earlier, but you know who is almost cast as Joe in Sunset Boulevard? Like multiple people, but yeah, go ahead. Marlon Brando was mm-hmm. one of them. I I cannot even picture that. Like Marlon Brando is a great actor, of course, that goes without saying, but I, I don't buy Marlon Brando uh, uh, becoming entranced by Norma in the same way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, me either. And um, also Montgomery Clift was supposed mm. to he actually like signed on and then he left um oh, really? which there are they are both similar actors in their style and i and i'm not sure that their style m- would have felt right for this movie too so super interesting yeah it's it's always so strange uh when we find out like what almost happened and it makes us all the more thankful that things worked out the way they did assuming of course that it did turn out okay uh, yeah, I think I think another Fred McMurray was briefly considered, which I can kind of see. But I think I think William Holden pulls it off really quite well. Yeah, uh, I I need to correct myself. Oh. I don't think it was the there was a sound version of that Greta Garbo movie. I'm oh, really? thinking was of something a, else and I can't. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Fair enough, but um, it was, so so it was also Greta Garbo in a sound version of one of her earlier movies, right? It was. I know at least it was a pairing of the two of like John Gilbert and her in a similar like romantic melodrama, and um, yeah, and so that kind of ruined his career. <laughs> and now yeah. I gotta find out what movie, but TV or. BRB on that. <laughs> okay. Well, while you look that up, I'll give just a couple of my own recommendations. So for uh, it, it's, it's weird how many times the universal monster series comes up between the mm. two of us, not only on this episode, <laughs> uh, 
But when I was watching The Gold Rush again, I was reminded, and it's a drastically different tone, so forgive me, but just the way that it opens in sort of like a snowy cabin and there's like a stranger coming in from out of town and mm. and how it's sort of divided really starkly into a couple of different acts, it reminded me of the original James Whale invisible man so i'm curious mm. if anyone's ever watched these those two movies in a double feature the gold rush and the invisible man because that's literally the only similarity but sometimes uh, just a little aesthetic similarity is all it takes i say and yeah the the invisible man is really uh one of the more effective universal monster movies i i believe it's got a fantastic Claude Rains performance, one of his best, I think. And mm -hmm. the effects, the invisible effects still hold up to this day. It's remarkable how how well they were able to pull off the fact that there is a man who's just not there. Like, it, it's, I, I defy anyone to find the seams in the effects in that movie. So mm -hmm. I don't want to know either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't tell me. I'm not going to give any peeks behind the curtain because I have not looked <laughs> myself, so I would not be able to. Uh, did you get a? Did you find out what uh, the yes. movie you were thinking of? What is it? Um, a Woman of Affairs, which um, Flesh of the Devil was 1926, and that one was 1928. So just within mm -hmm. a span of two years, uh, like things changed so fast for them. So yeah, well, interesting. I, I will take it on faith that all three are great, and I'll be making sure to add those to my list. Um, and then for Sunset Boulevard, uh, I already mentioned that the 1954 A Star is Born, really all four of them, because it's all tapping into the same cinematic tradition, but I feel like this one is kind of of the same era, and it happens to be my personal favorite of the four versions of that story mm. uh, have you ever seen there's one earlier than that it's called what price hollywood but it, it's like a kind of different variant of the same kind of story um hmm. it's really good i like that one too what was it called what price hollywood yeah cool i i have actually not heard of that so i'll have to add that to my list as well um <laughs> and uh and yeah just I, I hadn't thought of it before but yeah in a lonely place really fantastic do not sleep on that one it's mm -mm. uh i think nicholas ray is a kind of dramatically underrated director and this is uh, one of his more accomplished works so i'm always happy to recommend one of those emily thank you so much for joining me once again on extra milestone i'm delighted that we got to talk about a couple of classics because i know that's kind of a jam of both of ours yeah for real Thank you for having me. I was very glad to, and I hope to do it again someday. <laughs> and I look forward to that day. Let the listeners know where can they find you on this web that's worldwide of ours. Um, I'm on Twitter, Emily, K-U-B underscore. Mm -hmm. um, if you love old movie stuff i write a bi-weekly calm column um called beyond the classics so not classic movies but old movies that aren't really seen um and i had just one i had one go up on sunday about the old dark house oh. um which is also a universal james whale uh horror movie which is really cool um yeah that's it about all, me it all comes full circle i love it yeah i actually i i actually read that column of yours and i actually get a Aww. lot of really fantastic recommendations so definitely check that out uh you will thank emily later i'm also <laughs> on twitter at noland sam because handles are frustrating uh and I'm also on Letterboxd, just my name, Sam Nolan. That's where I spend most of my time on the interwebs. And uh, that uh, I'm never I'm never hard to be found on either of those places. And of course, I host this show every week along with the Patreon exclusive podcast that I host with Adonis Gonzalez. Those are all relatively easy to find just on cinemaholics.com. And with that, I believe we will sign off from a cabin in the Yukon with my friend, the giant chicken. I'm Sam <laughs> Noland. 
And I'm Emily Kubin-Kanik. And we'll see you on the next Extra Milestone.